Welcome to the Reimagine Podcast. Each week, give yourself 30 minutes and meet the people working hard to create the future of insurance today. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. And today we are continuing to explore how people should save and save more for tomorrow and uh, uh, hopefully save enough for tomorrow that uh, you actually end up eventually having a good life in retirement. So, Laura, do you want to introduce our our guest and uh, talk about the company? Yeah, absolutely. So with us here today is Spencer Barclay. He's the founder and CEO of Saveology, a digital finance planning and financial wellness company. He's a serial entrepreneur that has built and helped build startup ventures covering other areas of personal finance, financial services, such as credit, estate planning, investing, financial wellness, and retirement planning. So I'll, I'll let him speak more to you know his most recent um, his most recent ventures and a little bit more about how he got into the entrepreneurial field. But Spencer, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to the conversation. Yeah, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So uh, Spencer, just uh, first off for our guests, can you uh, just tell a little, tell people a little bit more about what your company does for people who are, what do do you do and for people and, and who are those people? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. We do digital financial planning. So our goal is to make some level of financial planning available to everyone, more accessible and more affordable than financial planning has historically been. So we, we do that digitally in order to realize some of the unit economics that you can get using technology. Um, and as we, as we built financial plans for tens of thousands of individuals, we found some unique distribution channels and unique demand in as a financial wellness benefit through employers. So now our primary focus is working with employers to offer financial planning to their employees. So our, our platform at Saveology is is a a platform where you can come build a financial plan. You get unique and personalized recommendations back to you about the things that you should do. And then if and when you need help, then there are financial coaches available for you to connect with, either by chat or by phone. That way you can bridge the gap between what is traditionally technology and and human without having to be uncomfortable. And we meet people where they're at. So that's Saveology in a nutshell. Before we uh, dive deeper into the problems, tell, tell us your backstory. How, how did not many people end up focusing on helping people save money today, but you did? Yeah, so my background is in a combination of entrepreneurship and financial services. And I, I didn't necessarily think this is exactly where I would end up, but after having done startups in, in credit and investing and retirement planning and estate planning, then I, I found some unique needs. In the market. So our last venture was a small company called Benefit Guard. We built 401ks for small and medium-sized businesses, and we thought we were making a real difference in the retirement world by reducing the fees that they pay in their 401k. And don't get me wrong, that helped in a lot of ways, but when we looked at the underlying data of what people were actually saving, I identified a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that people weren't saving enough money right? They, even if they had the incentive of a 401k match or even had a 401k plan available, they weren't putting enough money away for retirement. So after we sold that venture in 2017, uh, we sold it to a company called Health Equity, a publicly traded HSA provider. And we saw the, the power that happens when you combine a vehicle like a 401k with, with an HSA, and that helps improve outcomes. But what it doesn't do is address behavior. So after my acquisition buyout period at Health Equity, I I left to go start something that could address behavior. And we did a lot of market research to figure out what that would be. And we came to the conclusion that traditional financial planning had a way of impacting personal savings rates more than any other technology that we came across. So we said, let's, let's find a way to make that more readily available. So we that was beginning of 2019. We w- went out and raised money, got a couple investors on board to start building the platform, uh, launched that in October of 2019, tested it with tens of thousands of users, and then got to where we are today now, where we primarily offer it as a financial wellness benefit. So you mentioned a few things. So it's unique needs within the market. It's increasing accessibility. Where do you see specifically some some of how tech is changing savings habits? 
Yeah, that, that's a, it's a really good question. So when you look at the market as a whole in, in financial technologies and financial services, you see technology applied in a lot of different ways. And I like that it's applied in a lot of different ways because different people have different needs and, and different habits. So for example, roundups came up on the scene, you know, six, seven years ago where you could start making micro deposits from your account into a long-term savings account. And I originally thought that was a great way of, of putting away money for the future um, until I started delving into the, the back end behind what people did with that money and how it affected their day-to-day -day personal finances. And so that, that's one way that technology is being used to help improve finances, right? Small automated savings and the automated savings can, can do a lot of good things. But another way that, that it's doing it is it's just making old services more available, right? When you think about working with a traditional financial planner, what does that experience look like to you? It's usually going and finding a financial planner, which probably charges a, a, a good hourly rate, and bringing all of your documents to the financial planner, um, taking several hours to meet with them, then they go back and draw up a, a manual financial plan for you. They bring it back to you, sit with you for an hour, answer some of your questions. And that total process could have costed thousands of dollars and taken tens of hours of your time and tens of hours of that financial planner's time. And, and that's why it wasn't available to, to most Americans. And technology can bridge that gap because we can gather the data that we need way faster, right? We can automate the creation of a financial plan so that no person has to use their, their time and hourly wages towards that. And then we present that in a way that, that not only is more accessible, but that is personalized to them. Um, and we're able to do that by learning from tens of thousands of people. So I, I think those are a couple of ways that technology is making it more accessible and affordable. Now, you also mentioned there's a, a human component and uh, you know, just a little bit of, of you know, my background. I, I worked at a, a large uh, insurance company that had a, at the time, had a very large uh, and professional career agency force and at the same time had a very big uh, group benefit space. And uh, we had some very you know, sort of unique uh, success taking the right advisors and putting them in the workplace. Uh, now, a lot, there were a lot of challenges because uh, uh, a lot of these, as you know, large employers span the you know, across the country and coordinating individuals at scale is, is very difficult. Is this the problem you're tackling um, by pairing people eventually or with uh, people they can talk to? I think it's one one problem that we're tackling. I think there are a lot, and, and it culminates in, in low usage of, of financial planners or advisors, right? Like the, some of the re most recent statistics that I found are less than 10% of Americans use a financial advisor, and a lot of the ones that are using them are using it just to manage your investments. Um, if, if you get lucky and get a, a more comprehensive financial advisor, they might help you with insurances as well. But not many are doing holistic financial planning for the masses. So some of the problems that we think that we're addressing are, are number one, comfort. Right? A lot of people don't want to go meet with a financial planner when they're ashamed of their personal finances. And no matter how much money they have in the bank, there are always people that are ashamed of their finances in one way or another, because all of us can do a little bit better in managing our finances and aren't doing that. So adding, adding a human element as optional helps address the comfort side, right? Get them familiar and comfortable with it, with technology, and then to the degree that they need help, then introduce that financial element um, with the human. The, the second item that, that I think is relatively important is that most people don't want to take time out of their day anymore to go travel somewhere to meet with a financial advisor. And, and technology makes it way easier to do that, right? Um, in, in some of our conversations that we've had with people, they have told us they wouldn't have even considered talking to a financial coach or a planner if they had to have a phone call um, or go to an office. And so having an available option through chat to answer some very simple questions makes them get a little bit of, of comfort, but a lot of value very quickly. And, and so we're, we're figuring out what level of touch each person needs and then providing 
that level to that person, right? In a, in a large employer workforce of a thousand people, you might have a hundred of those people that want to talk to a financial advisor or planner, 900 that just want to use technology. And out of the 100 that want to talk to a financial planner, you might have 20 that are okay scheduling a call and 80 that are okay just chatting. And, and so we do want to meet people where they are and talk to them in ways that technology alone can't make prescriptions, you know, comfort them with, with their, with their, current situation, but we don't discount either side of it. We, we think that both of them are necessary to, to yield good long-term results. So, so how does it work? I mean, it, it sounds great. Say I'm interested. What do I do? Yeah. So let, let's look at it through a consumer lens first, right? If you're an individual that isn't going through an employer that, that we have on our, on our uh, platform, then you can go to saveology.com and you click a get started button to start building your financial plan. And we actually offer a free financial plan available to anyone. So there's no cost in, in running through that, that first financial plan. It takes about five minutes for you to build a personal financial plan by creating a profile. So you start answering questions about yourself that we try to keep relatively um, private, right? We don't ask for things like last name or social security numbers up front. We don't even ask for a date of birth. We ask for your first name and then questions about you. Are you married? You know, what are some of your goals? How much money do you have in different types of accounts? What insurances do you have? And in five minutes, we can gather enough information fr from you to put together a very accurate financial plan. Now, it might not have the 100% accuracy that you get by spending 20 hours on it, but to get 97% accuracy in five minutes is a pretty good trade-off. So that's where you start right enter your information and then it builds a plan for you and and you get three key things with your financial plan the first one you get is a, a holistic report card that tells you how you're doing in different areas right are you strong in savings and retirement but weak in insurance um, start opening your eyes to the whole realm of personal finance and I, I think you guys with what you do you see that whole realm a lot more yeah, some of us like to forget that estate planning exists right or forget about retirement until the time comes and so we give them 10 different grades in those categories to help them understand where they're at then we give them a financial plan uh, a financial plan a lot more traditionally speaking is is how are you doing in comparison to your goals uh, this is how much you're you're likely to have in retirement based on what you told us you want to have in retirement when you want to retire how much money you want to have in retirement etc uh, we analyze their savings rate and their debt to income ratio so they can get like all the key performance indicators related back to their personal finance. But for a lot of people that still might be over their head. So what, what we do, what we consider our secret sauce is our prescribed action items. So we take that whole that holistic financial picture and say, based on where you're at right now, here are the next five things that you can do. And they're kind of individual tasks or projects like you need to increase your term life insurance up to $250,000. And, and here's why. Here's the calculation. Here's education materials, et cetera. Um, or you need to increase your savings rate to 10%, right? That's the next thing you need to do. And, and here's why you do that. So we give them some bite-sized items for them to work on. And as they do those, their grades improve and they get closer to reaching their goals. So those are the three main things they get in the free version. And then if you're an individual, you can upgrade or you can get a, a version through your employer that's premium, which then includes your financial coach and your live account aggregation and other things like that. Yeah, well, well tell, tell, tell me how I do. I'm imagining I'm a head of HR. Now, I, I, are your clients, are the people who are, you're typically signing up head of HR or are you going through the benefits broker uh, to introduce Saveology? We do a lot of sales directly to human resource departments right now. I think in the long term, we'll have more conversations through benefits brokers. Those just take more time to get up and running. Uh, but so we, we see a little bit of both right now. Let's say you're the head of human resources. Right. Okay. So I could see one benefit would be it's something I can use to uniquely attract or retain employees. No one else is doing it. Number two would be that uh, – uh, uh, I might actually have longer, um, well, lo longer retention of employees because they're, they're just satisfied. I guess that's the, the first sort of first, attract, retain. Um, and I would think that this eventually would increase the participation rates in the 401k plans. How, how did I do? Uh, you, you did well. I think you addressed a, a few of the biggest ones, but not the absolute biggest. 
Um, the, the one that we see that resonates most closely with employers is the financial stress of their employees that affects the, those employees' performance. And that sounds soft, right? A lot of people think, well, financial stress, like that that doesn't really impact productivity or, or attendance at work. But a lot of research shows that it does pretty heavily. So for example, uh, 58% of employees report that their financial stress affects their productivity at work. Uh, on average, that financial stress from, uh, and we're talking about 80% of people that have some level of financial stress, makes them miss three and a half more days per year by being financially stressed, right? Sometimes it's just a matter of that they're taking calls from creditors or they're worried about their bank account or have to deal with, with matters. And everyone will have a little bit of that. Our goal is just to reduce it, right? Let's help them feel better about their, their personal financial situation to reduce the stress, which will help them show up to work more often. And then finally, I think when you calculate what that net impact value is, what we're seeing is that estimates range from 15 to 20 percent of total payroll that are impacted by the distractions and decreased productivity from people that are financially stressed. And, and it's the number one stressor reported by Americans. So we can help with the psychological side of that while actually improving the financial side of it as well, which I think you have to have both of those to be a competitive solution in the market. Do you find that advisors are utilizing your product as well? We do, yeah. So we actually have a whole segment of our product for advisors, and advisors can choose to use it directly with their clients or for new prospecting, or they can use it to provide financial wellness benefits, right? Our, our company's mission is to make financial planning more accessible and affordable and actionable than ever before. And if we narrow that, that market too much, then I don't think we can achieve our mission. So what we're seeing with a lot of financial advisors, they come in, they license our product, and then they either give away free financial plans or or charge subscription rates in order to use the platform. We power the back end, the financial planning, the action items, the communication, et cetera. Um, or for an organization, this finally allows an advisor to provide a good financial wellness platform to companies. Now, in our experience, those financial advisors aren't playing in exactly the same market as we are. We're usually offering direct financial wellness benefits to employer groups of 250 employees or above. Financial advisors are usually providing that to some of their, their friends, companies, or their network of companies. And, and those are companies as low, little as 10 employees up to you know 100 employees. And so it's a different market, but a scalable platform like this allows them to provide the same level of financial wellness that we can provide to the bigger groups. Interesting. Um, well, t tell us a little bit about the innovation environment uh, out in Utah. So um, as you know, we're, we've... Uh, you know, we're, we're physically based in Hartford, but have, have used the uh, pandemic as an opportunity to connect with, with different communities. What, what, what makes, uh, what makes uh, I guess, what are they, what, what, what's the term Silicon Slopes? What, what does it make Silicon Slopes work? Yeah, the term Silicon Slopes has been catching on over the last 10 years, uh, and, and we start to see it. I mean, if you've, you mentioned you kind of grew up here, had a house here in, in Sugar House, and um, when you come back and, and visit, you'll see that the environment is changing, right? We have big tech office buildings all along the freeway corridors now, and we're, what we're doing, I think, is, is, is two big things. One, we're fostering a culture of entrepreneurship where entrepreneurship is, is celebrated, right? People grow up now and want to be entrepreneurs. And, and I love that because it, it doesn't just create opportunities in finance or technology. Entrepreneurship can disrupt any area of life. And, and so I see that. Like my friends in high school, uh, a lot of them talked about wanting to start their own businesses. And, and we, we saw that because someone somewhere finally said, Let, let's start some businesses and start making it a thing. And now that has a snowball effect. And a lot of individuals now look at these companies that are raising money and having big exits and acquisitions and making big dents in the market and saying they want to do that too. So I think that's one. Um, I think another big one is the education system that we have here. We, a couple local universities are top rated in entrepreneurship and innovation. They empower it, they encourage it, right? Brigham Young University in Provo, they, they license out a lot of their inventions um, and innovation that happens in there to entrepreneurs to build businesses around. The University of Utah has a huge health and medical center. They have, a, I think, the number one amount of, maybe it's number two, patents in, in health and, and medical technologies in the nation. And so they're 
they're using that to have students create businesses and the universities benefit from it and the students benefit from it as well. And then I think the final piece, if I've just noticed maybe a little more anecdotally than anything, is that we grow up in this environment that is, uh, I would say, a lot more conservative than, than other areas around it. And, and people are looking to challenge the status quo in different ways, right? They, they grew up one way thinking one thing, and now that they're, they're growing up, they're blossoming and saying, you know, can we do things different than Utah has done in the past? And entrepreneurship is a great way to challenge the status quo, and it's starting to affect us. Um, it, we're starting to see that in the youth and in the education system and in the business and economy now. Now, if you could make a prediction, say five, 10 years out, what, you, you've talked a lot about you know, the ecosystem there, the culture there, how it's it's coming to fruition. What what would be you know a big dream that you'd have? What something that you'd be excited to see five or ten years down the road in Utah yeah, specifically? I think I I mean thinking a outside of myself, right? Thinking about the community and how it can develop. I'm thinking of a couple big things. Number one, like Salt Lake City isn't on the radar for most people. I think I've heard the term flyover state many times. And like, I think that will change. Um, I, I think that Silicon Slopes as it is now, like the innovation and the companies that we're seeing come out of here, will put Salt Lake City and Provo on a map that maybe currently is a flyover state. And, and that will do big things, right? That will compound the effects of entrepreneurship that we're seeing there because we need more outside capital. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get enough inside capital from Utah alone, but I, I think that capital will, will help accelerate that. And as soon as they can see some of these successful companies, then we'll get more outside capital, which will then fuel our ecosystem and economy even more. So I, I think that that's kind of two big things tied up into one. One, more innovation, more growing and building of, of big businesses, and two, outside capital that can help compound that. So uh, let's, talk, let's talk about your future, your, your immediate future. Um, you know, we have a lot of very interesting people listening to our, our show. Uh, what are the type of companies you, you'd like to partner with as you, as you grow your business? You know, the type of, of the profile of co the, the companies you'd like to put your, your product into? Uh, what type of other partners, you know, either you know, in the insurance or financial services uh, uh, venue are you looking for? And uh, yeah, what are your plans for uh, capital raise uh, or capital raises in the future? All, all good questions. I'll try to tackle them one at a time here. Um, the first one to any of your listeners that aren't directly affiliated with a, a company, right, that aren't looking to partner, aren't in financial services, just go create a financial plan, right? It's easy and it's free. Uh, see where you're at. See what you need to do to improve. We, we love to be able to help people in that way, and there's little to no obligation on your side to do that. Uh, number two, if you are part of a, a, a large company right now, then we'd love to help you in providing financial wellness benefits to you and to your employees or your colleagues. Uh, our target market in that is everyone from 150 employees and above. Most of the industries work really well. We do well in technology and financial services, banks, credit unions, healthcare, professional services. We, we might not do quite as much in some other areas like uh, retail or restaurants. Um, not that we can't do those. We just haven't seen as much success there yet. So if you're part of a, a large or a growing company and want to expand your benefits, we can help you do that really affordably to make a meaningful impact on you on, on your own personal finances and the financial stress of your employees. Then number three, I think you'll have a lot of other companies out there that, that aren't just employers, right? Financial service related in some fashion. And we have a lot of partnership opportunities, right? We mentioned that financial advisors can use our product um, to provide financial wellness or, uh, to employers or to provide financial planning to their clients. We'd love to hear from financial advisors and planners. Uh, second, uh, in that same channel, we have... I think benefits brokers, right? A lot of our distribution partnerships that are coming are in benefits brokers that currently do healthcare. We can create more sticky solutions for your employers and provide more value to them so that they stick with you as a benefit broker a lot longer. And some enrollment companies as well, we're, we're seeing that. It's another form of it. Um, final, final component of that in a partnership is like an HRIS company. If, if you have any human resource information systems, then we love to partner with those to help increase our scale and efficiencies in delivering our financial wellness platform to more employees. What's one piece of advice you'd give to a budding entrepreneur? So we talked about you know looking forward for the company, but those who 
aren't quite at the same stage as where you are right now in your entrepreneurial career, what's a piece of advice you'd give to somebody? Narrowing it down to one piece, I, I think is tough. It might, it might not quite reach everyone. So I'm gonna break it down to two small ones. Uh, number one is go for it. Just try it, right? A lot of people want to do something in entrepreneurship but are scared um, or they're worried. So start somewhere. I don't, I don't care what you do, right? Start selling t-shirts. Start providing a service to your local neighborhood. Like pick up something on the side that you can do to get your foot in the door and see how you like it. I, I think that is is a huge one to get people started. Those people, in, in my experience, my, my friends, close family members, et cetera, that have started that often end up going a, a broader entrepreneurship route after trying it. So advice number one, just get started. Number two is is don't quit. Like entrepreneurship is difficult. Like I, I can't even quantify the amount of stress that I feel uh, from time to time. Um, an, an example of this, uh, and it actually answers one of Paul's earlier questions that slipped my mind is on our fundraising side. Like we're, we're working on closing a, a fundraising round next week. Um, and the process leading up to that the last month is incredibly stressful, right? You're, you're trying to align the interests of investors, um, of new investors with, with previous investors and stakeholders with our, our team, um, while also making sure that we get the capital that we need to grow and to make payroll, right? Those are, those are things you have as an entre entrepreneur that you never think about when you're sitting in a thousand person company because someone else is making payroll for you. So don't, don't quit when that, when that stress comes your way, right? Find a good way to manage it with an accountability partner or an advisor or a friend or a mentor, but know that you will have stress along the way. And if you can endure that stress, the path of entrepreneurship will be worth it for you. That's great. That's great. So, uh, Spencer, how, how do people uh, find your company? How do they uh, reach out to uh, connect directly with you? What's the best, what's the best way? Yeah, to, to find the company, Savology.com is probably the best place to go. S-A-V-O-L-O-G-Y.com. Uh, to find me, I, I recommend LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to, to listen to or talk to new people, to help however I can. Um, I hear probably too many sales pitches on LinkedIn, but if you have anything worthwhile, then you can find me on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll connect with you. I'll give you a Calendly link and we can schedule a time to chat. Great. That's, what else, Laura? That's great. You know, I, I think it, it sums it up nicely. It's um, you know, I, I'm just thinking back to your pieces of advice, and I came from our office uh, in downtown Hartford earlier today with a group of actuarial students who are going through what's called the actuarial boot camp. And I had one of our entrepreneurs in the program join me, and Michael Davis from Egghead AI, and he was saying to the students, you know, it's, it's difficult, you have to remain determined, you cannot give up, and you always have to, you know, stay fresh-footed and... Um, and have your eye on the prize because this stuff takes time it's important and if you put in it put in the work you'll see you know you'll see the results out of it so it's been fascinating to learn more spencer about your journey about saveology and you know i know i can speak for myself when i'm i'm going to go online i'm going to create a financial plan i'm going to see how i'm doing how my kpis are and uh see what next steps i can take so thank you so much for joining us here today good yeah it was my pleasure i'm, I'm glad you guys invited me Hey, thanks, and uh, th thank you for all the listeners. Give us feedback and uh, s tell us who you'd like to hear on uh, next. So thanks so much, and uh, tune in next week for another episode of the, the Reimagine Podcast. Thanks. We want to especially thank today's sponsors, Launch and Symmetra. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more great information about this company and other great startups at imagine.nfg.com.